okay can everyone hear me or i need to be louder it's okay okay thank you everyone for joining the session today my name is rashita me and my colleague lin will be presenting the session today to you so today we are going to talk about some of the coding best practices basically clean code uh so let's start our topic so before moving forward this will be our agenda we will speak a bit on what do we mean by clean code then some of the principles on how to write clean code what are code smells some common code smells and ways to refactor them good practices more on engineering practices for cleaner code then what next for you and some resources this will be our agenda followed by q and a and feedback session so before starting on actual content let me just clarify and set the expectation so we assume that most of the audience here are developers and a newbie developer and we assume that you have a basic understanding of object oriented programming so moving forward in the slides when i use the term classes objects methods you you understand what that means and we won't go into too much of details into that however if you are a newbie and you find it difficult to absorb so many information in one hour feel relaxed we will be sharing the resources with you and you can explore more at your own pace later so that's our intent for this session and if you are an experienced developer you will find it as a maybe quick refresher for the clean code practices so and this is a very huge topic it's difficult to cover it in one hour let's start uh, so on a lighter note how many of you can relate to this have you ever felt something like you're trying to understand the code and then thinking oh my god is there a comment i can understand it better so this is a very common thing which usually happens uh so when you write the code in real business project we work in a team and the business requirements change very often so when you write a piece of code it is working fine that's good enough no that's not good enough it's working beautifully it's okay but there will be other team members who are going to touch that part of code and if they don't understand it over time it will become messy and over a period of time it will become so messy that the whole team productivity will just fall down uh so that's the reason we sh- as a developers it's our responsibility to have clean code starting with some of the codes here it's not enough for code to work and by robert c martin and from martin fuller any fool can write code that computer can understand good programmers write code that humans can understand the reason i already explained because your team members need to understand the code which you write for to make it maintainable now writing coding softwares like writing coding is a two step process first step is to make it work that is the most important step once you have it working the next step is to clean it up so in real business projects usually what happens the developers tend to forget about the step 2 which leads to a messy code so that's why we all are here like there is a step 2 always remind yourself when your code is actually working now there is a step 2 to, to clean it up uh so let's see what do we mean by clean code now there is no such formal definition of a clean code but these are some of the maybe like characteristic of clean clean code and these these have come from what most of the pioneers in our software industries say about clean code so it is easy to read simple and clear small and obvious code covered by test it when you read through the code you feel like it's it's a well written prose it's easy to deliver new feature it's hard for bugs to hide written you feel like it's written by someone who cares and it has minimal dependency so the definition can vary from person to person but you can consider it these like main characteristic of clean code next uh, so how do we write clean code now writing a clean code is an art and there are lot of principle techniques guidelines which helps you to achieve writing a clean code and today we are going to discuss mostly these four sections and the good part is the principles which we will be discussing are language agnostic so any language you might be working it is applicable to all of them and today session these four uh i'll be covering we we came up with these four because we feel these are the most important and the most basic to follow ones uh, to follow so let's start with our first thing the naming convention 
Now, uh, even though it may sound very trivial, very easy, but this is something which is highly abused and uh, uh, just having a descriptive name improves readability a lot and saves a lot of effort for the developers because if the name itself is descriptive enough, sometimes the developers might not go to, in, like if we have a function, the name clearly reveals the intention, no need to go inside the working logic to understand it. They, that saves a lot of time because usually we will have a huge code with complex functionalities. So let's say for example, uh, we will be having a lot of examples in uh, later slides. And one more thing to highlight is, it's these guidelines and principles are not casted in stone. So everything has a trade-off. Do what's best for your team or what makes your code readable. The end goal is to have it clear and simple. So always remember clarity is king. So uh, it's not that if it's written like, don't do this, don't do that, you have to follow it. What's best for your team, what's best, best for your current structure of code, you need to do that to make it, to keep it clear and simple. So let's, let's start with our first convention. Always provide descriptive names and use intention revealing name. So for in the example, you can uh, yourself identify which one would you prefer. Is int d and then writing a comment, is that better to read or just elapsed time and days? It's, it's very obvious from here that the second one is much more cleaner and readable. And other thing to highlight here, the moment you feel like you need to comment it, it it's, it's an alarm that something is wrong, the name is not descriptive enough that you are going to add a comment for it. The next one is like avoid temporal names like example A1, A2, these are not concerned because it doesn't reveal the intention of what, what do you want to do with it. Then avoid noisy words, sometimes like you have a user array or a user table, adding that array or table in the end doesn't add any extra information or any value for the reader, it it's makes it just more wordy. The next one is be consistent, uh, for example, for doing the same thing there can be many uh, words like fetch, retrieve, get, now you want to fetch something from the API. So have a, be consistent in all your classes, if you are fetching API then use fetch. It should not be like some classes fetch, some classes retrieve. Be consistent. Another example can be like some people in your team are using handle click in some classes, some classes on click. We should avoid that. Have a standard naming convention and be consistent with the names you follow. Another thing is, uh, again an example, use pronunciable names. From the code example itself, you can identify, obviously the second one is more readable and more understandable. So even though you can like assume like MDH, MS, maybe minute, days, hours, something like that. But when you just read three lines of code, you see that how much difference it can make. And imagine if it's a very huge complex code, having a proper name, how much difference it can bring and how much efforts it can save. Then avoid abbreviations. For example, the first one is not very clear. Now let's say here you have M underscore DSC, let's say you have P underscore DSC or L underscore DSC. You yourself will have to keep track what does that mean. However, if the names are very clear, you your mind doesn't need to keep track of all the variables and you can easily follow along. The next one is, uh, you name your classes differently and methods differently. Why? Because the classes and objects are basically designated by nouns. The good example can be like, it can be invoice, product, user. These names are like good names for classes. The methods must be designated by verbs. Why? Because the sole purpose of the functions or the methods are to do something. We know that we write functions to do something. So what they do, their intention should reveal in their name. For example, send proposal, it's very clear, pay taxes. If I name a function proposal, then you might not know, okay, what this function does. You will go inside the function, check what it does. If you name this function as proposal, or let's think about send proposal to be approved. This name also is not very accurate. Why? Because the function might be like, I'm sending the proposal for getting the approval. It might get rejected also. There are two cases, approved or rejected, but the name says to be approved. It's, it's a bit vague, not very clearly identifying what what the function will be doing. Next, we will be, okay, that was all for the naming convention. And stating again, that's not an exhaustive list. There are lot many guidelines and rules, but since we have one hour session, we, we try to 
pick only the important ones what we felt was more important the another topic we will be discussing is object and data structure now towards writing cleaning code this this is also one step you should clearly understand the difference between your objects and data structure when should you use object when should you use data structures now objects are something like they hide their data behind like abstract their data and only expose their functions and the sole purpose of data structure should be to expose the data while it should not have any meaningful names i'll i'll show the example of an object and data structure usually in the code we see what happens is uh, when the developer is confused and they mix up so some structures are half object and half data structure it makes it very difficult to add new changes later uh, so it, it's not a clean code when you mix the data structure and object together so the the rule is always hide the internal structure of your object we should be telling it to do something and not exposing the internal implementation of it and for that reason be always mindful when to add getter and setter so usually developers might be adding getter and setter for every of the variable which is not a good practice and there are some data structure like data transformation objects and active records and the sole purpose for them is to communicate with the databases to pick up the raw data transform it and expose it to the code for being used in other classes so we should avoid adding any logic to the our dtos and active records uh to have a more proper understanding so now here you see the first one is the data structure why because it's not exposing any behavior it is exposing only its data it doesn't have any behavior only data and on the other side is an object so you see the uh, the data is like the private variables it's not exposed outside what is is exposing is its function it only is exposing its behavior while the data it's working on it's completely hidden so this is an example what's your object and how uh, this side is the data structure and when you have a data structure don't add any business logic to it this is like what clean code says to have a cleaner code and now to achieve this like hiding internal structure of your object there is a principle called the law of demeter or the principle of least knowledge so what this principle says is a, a method of a class c should only call the method of class c in object created by f or an object passed as an argument argument or an object held in the instance variable of c which the meaning in very simple terms would be talk to your friends not to strangers and talk to only your close units so in the diagram also you can see a communication between a and c is discouraged the diagram like it violates the uh, law of demeter in terms of example if you see the the red block here the ctxt context is an object now i mentioned the to have a cleaner code we want our object to hide its implementation details but here you see there is lot of dependency and there is lot of uh, information we are exposing however le let's say ctxt the context is a data structure now the sole purpose of data structure to is to expose its data so if it's something like that that's okay because the its purpose is to expose the data that's fine but if it's an object following this coding style is not a good one and it will be it will lead to messy code later on so let's think how should be the good thing so so let's say the requirement is we want to create a new file and for that we want to get the absolute path and here i'm not showing you the complete code the idea is just to expose the thought process behind this so now if say we want to achieve it one way is to think is okay get the absolute path and then do something and create file or we can have something like this now obviously the next one is much more cleaner because it's not exposing anything it's it's hiding all its implementation detail so it always depends on the requirement and what do you want to achieve uh mostly how do you design your code maybe so if you always want to hide the internal implementation uh for an object this was about data structure let's move on to classes now so the classes are the building blocks of our code and since building blocks what will you prefer to build something you will prefer small blocks rather than the large units of blocks because smaller blocks gives you more flexibility so what clean code if you want to achieve cleaner code the classes should be small 
the classes should be responsible for doing one thing and that can be achieved through single responsibility principle things that change together should be placed together and unrelated things should be kept separate so classes should maintain cohesion the classes we write should be prepared to allow changes because change is inevitable so some principle which help you achieve that is if you follow open closed principle and we want our classes to be isolated from change the principle that helps us to achieve that is dependency inversion principle we will be looking at these principles with some example but why do we want our classes to be small and organized so what do you prefer you you would like to have uh, organized toolboxes with small drawers with well defined components or do you want few drawers with everything tossed into it which one will you prefer obviously the first one right it will be easy to manage when we have the small drawers with well defined components so the idea behind organizing our class is to keep the class as small and organized so let's see the first principle which is single responsibility principle so we say that classes should have one responsibility and look at the picture which one would you prefer the first one is a big class doing too many things the or the the below one which is each class has its defined responsibility and each one is doing its own work not dependent on others let's say if i want to change the cooking structure uh, cooking uh, instructions obviously making any change in the above diagram will will impact the other works because the same entity is doing all the task in the second diagram what if i want to change the cooking instruction i just need to bother bother the last one who is cooking the other classes can continue doing its job no impact on others so like this is what in the picture form we want to achieve we want small organized class and for that we have single responsibility principle which says that every class should be responsible only for one thing there should be only one reason to change that thing another thing you can think of is if you cannot come up with a concise name for your class then something is wrong let's say in the name if you uh, have some if and or it's a clear indication that your class is doing more than one thing or if your class name is something like manager processor super it's also a clear indication that your class is doing more than one thing so let's see uh, what do you think about this class now this class i have just taken a snippet this is only half of it there are a lot more up and there were a lot more functions up and down so if you encounter this kind of class you can think what how difficult it is to make any change or any amendment here so usually this kind of class is referred to as a god class which is like doing all the things doing everything so we we don't want this kind of code this want of classes in our code and what we can do for this if you encounter this big class the first step should be extract out smaller classes from it so from this you can see the the three i can easily identify that get project first project get last project this is it's it can be extracted out into the smaller class and this has lot of scope into extracting into smaller class so whenever you have like this big class that's that's a alarm that okay something is wrong you sh you should not have this big class uh moving on to the next thing is maintain cohesion so we say that our classes we write should maintain cohesion to keep it small now what do we mean by cohesion now this is an example of a class here we have two variables and three methods if you see the three of the methods are highly dependent on those variables so these two methods are using all the two variables the first method is using one of the variable so here we see that the methods and the variables are highly codependent so this is a example of highly cohesive class let's say another example of less cohesive class let's say you have four variables and two methods so the green variables are being used in the green method the orange one are you being used in the orange method however the green one has nothing to do with the orange variables so this one is less cohesive and this one is a clear indication that there is a scope of breaking it into two separate smaller classes because this is less cohesive so when you try to maintain cohesion you will end up having many smaller classes and that is the intent of clear code clean code now when we write our classes we need to be prepared for change because change is inevitable 
Now let's see an example. If we have a class something like this SQL which have certain behaviors, if we know that this class is going to be changed very frequently, how do we ensure that when we add new features here, the existing features don't get impacted? And if this class is a very volatile one, we need uh, too many changes, very frequent changes. We need to do something about it to every time ensure that the existing functionality did not break. So how do we ensure that? So there is a principle called o open close principle which states that the classes should be open for extension but closed for modification. So what it means is we organize our classes or write our code in such a way that when we add new behaviors we can easily extend it but we should not be touching the existing code. So let me explain it with a diagram view. If we organize the same classes in this way, so what we did was we just in, introduced an abstract method and then each of the functionalities have is created as its own class. Now this gives us flexibility in future we want to add new items, we can just add the new classes without really touching the existing ones. So we are very sure that we did not touch the existing classes, the, there will be no breaking in the existing functionalities and we can easily integrate our new behaviors. So this is one way of uh, ensuring that the existing functionalities don't break and this also leads to many smaller classes. And moving on to the next one, uh, how do we isolate our classes from changes? So we don't our, want our classes to be rigid, we want it to be flexible. So how there is a principle called dependency inversion principle. So the one you see here, we have a class A which is depending on the concrete implementation of class B. We don't want that because every time there is a change in B, it will impact the A because it's directly dependent. Now what do we do to isolate the changes of B from A? So we can introduce an abstract layer by introducing an interface. So the flexible, the green diagram you see, we don't directly depend on the concrete implementation of class B, instead we are depending on the abstract implementation. So now any change in class B will not impact class A, even though they are dependent. So let's see an example, let's say we have a portfolio class and that depends on stock exchange. So now if the stock exchange keeps changing, our portfolio also keeps changing. So how can we avoid that? So following the dependency inversion principle, what we can do is we can introduce an abstract layer. So instead of a concrete stack exchange, stock exchange class, we create an interface and that whichever functionality wants to implement, we can extend it and pass it as a constructor or constructor or something. and uh, this is how we avoid the direct dependency on concrete implementation. Now the portfolio class depends on the abstraction of stock exchange and any change in stock or let's say you are writing a test, you can easily write a test for portfolio because now the stock exchange you are not directly uh, depending on the current price. You can just mimic the current price in your test and that's how your class is completely isolated from stock exchange concrete implementation. Uh, okay, now this slide we have because we decided when we are talking about clean code and not talking about test, it, it's incomplete to bring up test. However, this is like just scratching on the surface, it's, it's a very huge topic, but we just wanted to ensure that we introduce this to you. So now test code is as important as production code. Usually we tend to ignore the test and don't clean our test, but it's as important to clean our test as much as we clean our production code. So why should we do that is because test gives you the actual confidence to make changes to your production code. If your tests are not clean, eventually the test will rot and so will your production code. So it's very important to keep your tests clean. Some of the like rules for having a clean test is uh, following the first rules that is fast, independent, repeatable, self-validating and timely. So what this says is your test should be fast, it should run very quickly. The reason for this is if, if imagine your tests are running very slow and the developers need to run the test every time they make some changes. If it's running very slow, they will be very demotivated it to run very frequently. So for that reason, we want it to be fast. Independent means the test should not depend on each other. 
repeatable in any environment for example QA or sta staging the same set of tests can be repeated. Self validating that means it should have a boolean output like either pass or fail no, no other manual interpretation of the results or something. Timely like we should be following TDD it should always be written uh, before writing the production code. Now some of the things here are already taken care by the latest test frameworks but as a developer like when we write test it is our responsibility to keep it clean like single concept per test. We should not write test with like too many assertions in that. For example, if you want to write a test for uh, uh, approving something and notifying something. So your test should not be should approve and notify. If you have something to test like that, it should be should approve, should be in one test and the notification feature be tested in another test. So basically your test also needs to be clean. Consider your test give your test the same weightage as you give to your production code. Now next we will be covering some of the code smell and for that I will pass on to Lynn to continue on the code smell topic. Thank you. How is everyone doing? Stay can cope with the all this session. We have a few chair here also. Like if you guys want to be move along or like there's uh, some empty spaces here also. Before we start. Back yeah, there's uh, some few chairs behind also. Okay, are we good? Shall we start? Okay, um, what is code smell? So literally, they don't smell, but definitely they can stink. So let's talk about what are the code smells. So the code smells means that there is uh, any symptom in our source code. Probably they are indicating about that there's a deeper problem. They are not technically if they are not a bug, they are not technically incorrect or they are do any prevention from program for functioning. But they are usually like weakness in design and implementation choice that could hinder for us to be further development and also maintenance, also very hard to evolve our code. And also as a result, it could also increase the risk of some failure and a defect also. So bad code smart could be uh, also an indicator of the factor that contributed to the technical deck because of the, the, the poor quality of the code is written. So if you, have a if you want to change uh, some code in a one place, right, you have to change in many places and other places too. That means that, that we have a code smell. And uh, usually, even those we learn about all those clean code and all that technique and the principle, right, uh, because uh, we are working on the very tight deadline or like there's no good engineering practice or sometimes like we don't have like, you know, good code review or like we miss some code review, this code could not be uh, inevitable. So determining what or what is not a code smell is very subjective. So it can be varied by their like, language and developer and uh, methodology also. But from this session, uh, we have covered for some of those common code and uh, we will see uh, some of the way how to refactor them. So let's start with the first smell. Duplicated code. So duplicated codes like they are like identical or very similar piece of code or can more than one places. So in a buff example here also, right, we have a two method. One is called the is pass, another one is pass with credit. What do they do? So we got the sum marks from the student and then uh, calculate the average and uh, checking. So they are exactly the identical, just only the one line is different. So this is also a sign of the duplication. So sometimes also even those the code may look like not exactly the same. The duplication also could be occur. They are performing the same job. So there might be some code with a different method name, different implementation, but they are doing the same thing. So this is also a duplication. This is a sign of duplication. And usually also like when we are working on the same project with the cross team and uh, we have a lot of communication and uh, people tend to produce the same code over and over again and again. So how we can refer to this kind of duplicated code? So from here, right, this code and this code are duplicated. So if there's a duplication, 
in the same class, what we can do is we can make extra data and do a new method. Or if a duplication in different classes, we can create a, some class hierarchy. If there's some duplication occur in some child classes, then we can pull it into the parent class or super class. So from the above example also, right, we create another private method to calculate for the average. Then we don't need to duplicate anywhere. And then one good thing about this refactoring is our method also became as shorter and easier to understand and easy to maintain. And uh, moreover, because we make, make centralize all those like code duplication in one place, right? If there's something need to be changed, we only have to change it on our private method. We don't need to change on the two different places also. Okay, next. So this is very, very common also, like when we start writing a code, right? Like as a developer also, we try to be like very uh, futuristic. So we always put some placeholder for the future requirement. We always justify like, uh, yeah, we might need it for later. But in the end, uh, those classes like nobody use, nobody care also, nobody maintain. And then uh, some of those classes like, like some interface or abstract classes, they are only implemented by one class. And they even have a chance to live once, probably called by the some task method or task class only. And like those classes also, right, we tend to add on a more feature or more implementation, getting forgotten, buries, and then lost in the documentation also. So this example here, we have an abstract ad address class, and we have an interface to implement some logic, and we have a home address extent. So from the example that I can justify like, yeah, we might need it for address, uh, office address, that's why that's, we have an abstract and we have an interface. So this is a sign of the Cosmo also. Do we really need it for the like, those abstract class and uh, our interfaces? Actually, no, right? So how we could refactor this kind of Cosmo? So if we see this kind of Cosmo, right? If we see there's uh, some end use um, abstract class or interface, we can collapse into hierarchy. If there's a, some unnecessary delegation of the functionality to another object, we can maybe put it into the inline class or we can use the inline method. And it totally remove those and use parameter feed or method. These are, they are just nice in our code base only. Just rule of thumb is like, create a code for the current requirement, nothing more, nothing less. So from the above example, after we refer to it, right, we can totally get rid of our address and interface. It's no longer necessary even though we need it for the office address, we can uh, instantiate it from the existing uh, address class. Okay, next. So this is like one of the uh, very common Cosmo in everywhere. So this, we have a, like this checkout method and it's doing a lot of things. This is like one of the clean code, violating the clean code principle also. It's doing more than one job. So because of it's doing so many things right, we have to put in the comment also to understand about which session of code is doing what. So, and also there's no clear cohesion also. There is, it's very hard to understand. Why do we need to, this checkout method is like doing so many things, like so many jobs, like calculating the total price, calculating the delivery fee, and also storing the database. Also maybe creating a, some object and return or something. So how we can uh, be understand about this kind of a uh, code smell, right? If you are writing a method and uh, your method is too long, people tend to uh, um, like subject like, uh, you know, um, how many lines that we should be inside in the method. So most of the people agree is like, it's more than 10 line. We should ask a question, is it this method is doing this one thing or like doing uh, many things, okay? And usually what could be happen is, of course, no one intend to implement this kind of long method, right? We tend to add more thing because we are adding more feature or more implementation. So usually this kind of class, this, this kind of code methods are like large class or long method. So how can we refer to that one? If we found this kind of long method, we can be extracted into the smaller methods. For large classes also, we can split into the smaller class and create a hierarchy for those common logic. So above, right, uh, for checkout method, of course, this is just one level of refactoring only. We can maybe put it into the private method for calculate total price, calculate delivery fee. So we don't need to be like putting so many things inside our checkout method. And a good thing about here also, since 
we use the same clinical principle of the like uh, naming convention and descriptive name. We don't even need to write a comment. By checking here, we can understand like this checkout method is doing calculate the price, delivery fees, update DB, and so forth and so forth, right? If someone want to interested what is the implementation, they can redo the individual private method and see. Okay. And uh, one of those good things about this refactoring is it, it can also help us to avoid duplication also because we isolated those logic and a code into a different smaller method. Okay, next Cosma, it's long parameter list. This is also similar to the, the previous example also. So usually when we are adding a new function or when we are adding a new feature, we might be in turn of we are considering for the uh, good design and a code consideration. We might be adding on the existing method and like it ended like having a so many uh, parameter lists. And it also it could be possible because of the some method, multiple method are merged into a single method. So that's why that we meet, we need so many parameter lists. One good rule of thumb is like, if we need more than three parameter, right, we need to ask. Do we need all those parameters for this method implementation? If yes, probably we might be any have a long method. We have to consider how we can refactor it. Okay? And also this kind of long parameter list method are very hard to understand, hard to change also, and even hard to reuse. So people will be afraid to call this method from somewhere else, even this like want to get the format address or get the order. Because we don't know what is, why do we need so many parameter in the first place? So how we can refer to this kind of long parameter list? One way is those group related parameter together and introduce in a parameter object. So from the above example, right? Uh, instead of passing down all those string value for format address, then we can pass the address object. It's less, less parameter and uh, it do the same job also. Same for the, the below example also, to get the orders right. This is kind of like a look like that is query the data from the maybe order table or something. We can create the query object. So po put it all those like related information into the one um, class, then we can call, uh, pass it down into our method. So, so there's another way also is like, uh, we can also replace the parameter with the method call if we found out those parameters as, uh, as a result of another method call, instead of passing down, getting the result and passing down into the separate method, we cannot directly use the method call. And uh, we can also preserve the whole object instead of passing down from the group of parameter. Okay, and also benefit of this refactoring is, is shorter, is more readable. Yeah. Next one. So this is, all call is a primitive obsession. So why did this is it's a very bad practice of using the primitive type to represent the domain object. So from here, right, we have a customer class with the name, email, unit, streets, city, country, post echo, and blah, blah, blah. So it, this kind of code also, the one of the um, disadvantages is they could tend to grow in a number of primitive along with the behavior. So if we need it for, let's say, office address, are we going to add some other variable here related to office address? And it could be get worse when this same primitives are need to be defined in different places. We will be end up having a duplicated code. So how could we refer to this kind of thing? Very simple. Create a class to represent the, those related together and also move along with the behavior. It will be give us it more flexible to use the object instead of using the primitive type. And it also bring us a more cohesion organization to the domain level. So from the above example, right? Instead of using all those string value, we create the address class, then we can make use of the address class in our customer. Okay, next one. So this one is data clump. So data clump is like, piece of data found in a many, many parts of the, our code base when they can be, they, they are seems to be related together. They doesn't make sense in isolation, but only make sense together. So how we can detect this kind of data clump, right? If you want to make sure whether we have a data clump or not, just delete one of those part, those of the data value and see whether they are still make sense. So in an example 
there's a two examples, right? For the apply leaf, to apply the leaf, we need a front and two, right? If we remove the one of those dates, it doesn't make sense. Uh, this method is doing nothing. And uh, for the booking also, to make a booking, we need a uh, like customer name, guest name, uh, password number, password issue date, passport expiration date, right? If we remove one of those value, it doesn't make sense. It's this method is doing nothing. So how could we refer to this kind of data clump? Group those like data together into a class and introduce the parameter object. So instead of passing the two many um, parameter, right, we create the data range as a class and it passes as a parameter object. Same for the booking also. We create the guest info uh, class and a pass it down. And it also it shrink the parameter list and it's also much cleaner to see. Right, the next one is nested condition. So the nested conditions like, this is very common also like in our code base, right? There's a so many layer of if as statements or sometimes switch statement also. So why do we have this kind of nested condition? It could be possible as like, maybe initially we just start with a very simple conditional checking and we need to add for more feature or maybe we need to fix some defect. Then we end up having so many nested conditions. So these nested conditions are very hard to read hard to understand, hard to maintain also. The deeper the nesting, the longer it will take us to refactor. So there's a few techniques that we can use. Use a ternary operator. Most of the modern programming language support ternary operators. So instead of we are having an if statement, use the ternary operator here to do for the same logic and same thing. And also it's much more cleaner. Instead of we have a four line, right? We can end up with the one line of code. And the uh, next one is a simplified condition. So what is this doing? It's like this total quantity is greater than 50. We set it to some value to true or false. We cannot put it into the one line only. Why do we have to do for the nested? Of course, this is just a, some uh, example only. But in reality, right, there might be uh, many layer of like if a statement that we have to go through, right? Next technique is we can combine those conditional also. So this is also very common one. Like we have so many layers of a statement and it might be analyzed, like we only have one S statement. So why we cannot combine those conditions? We can use an and or all operator to combine those nested layer. It will be much more cleaner, much more easy to read also. And the next one is we can use a guard clause to exit early. So here is the example is if the query is not now, we want to do something, right? We can think about the other way. If query now, what we want to achieve? So we try to exit early before we go into the, all those nested. Uh, and uh, just be aware that everything must be in a mod moderation, don't abuse. So even if we suggest to use for those kind of technique and all those things, right? The below ASMS are very hard to read. What is this doing? There's a very, the is statement with like, not A and B or C and D. I even kind of differentiate like what would be the output of that one. And same for the um, ternary operator also, this is abusing. We have two levels of ternary operator. Okay, so try to avoid this kind of things. And last but not least, so for the Cosma, we cannot talk about, we cannot end the Cosma without the bad comment. So bad comments are also like some piece of code, they are not such explanatory. That's why that we have to put a comment in the first example, right? What is FDF is doing? We don't know. So that's why that we have to put a comment. Why we cannot use a clean code techniques like use a descriptive name? Then we don't even need to uh, have a comment. And the second, second example is like to do. This is very like most of the developer also tend to do. We are writing a code. The comment should not be on your reminder. If you see this kind of to do thing, we need to take it and we need to check. Why do we have to to do to do comment? Is it we cannot do it at the moment or something is blocking us? If we can, uh, this kind of to do is like add a unit test. Why you don't write a unit test in the first place? Why you have to put for the reminder? And the second, uh, and the third example. So this, ex this test, that example also is like uh, do something big. We don't know what is this method is doing. That's why that we have to put the, some description on the top of the method. So when I was preparing for the slide, I just want to make a joke. So like this mother get the item from DB, 
wash dishes, take a walk, blah, blah, blah. So we don't even know what it's doing. So in a, one of the signs also, this is doing so many things and we don't understand. If we break down into the smaller matter, we can totally get rid of those comments. And the last but not least, some of the code also, we cannot put it for the, um, we have a, those commented code, okay? Why do we have to comment it or code? That's, we are using a source control system, right? Why do we have to use a source control system? If you, the code are no longer needed, why we cannot totally get, uh, get rid of from uh, our code base? So it will be much more cleaner also. And also, if you see this kind of common code, right? Usually, people will also tend to forget also. And they're also afraid to delete because, oh my, someone is doing this, like maybe there's uh, some meaning behind. So it's very, um, very, very annoying. <laughs> okay, that's all for the um, Cosma. There's uh, many Cosma that we haven't talked about in our session because of a due to time limit. But I hope that, that, that you guys understand about the, some of those common Cosma and how we can refer to it and uh, can be produce a better code. So the next is some good practices for the um, cleaner code. So we have come up with a summer idea, what should be the good engineering practices to write a cleaner code. Okay, usually, right, we don't always get a chance to start from the uh, clean state. Many times and most of the time also, we are working on the existing repo and it's very important to clean, otherwise it's very difficult. So first thing is remember ab about the, be mindful about the y scope rule. Leave your code better than you found it. So even though the code is clean, before you, you found it and then you mess it up, that's, that is like your responsibility to cl clean it also. And one you should refer to is every time remember to refer to. Next one, have a some good engineering practices in place. So have a good regular code review. Not everyone is perfect. Even the senior dev also could reproduce a uh, bad code and a Cosma when we are reaching for the, some delivery or some tie, um, tie line, right? So we can detect all those Cosma during the code review. So don't skip the code review. I mean, like I have encountered sometimes also like in a project, right, when we are rushing, like people say, oh, let's skip the code review and then push the code, okay? And next one is like people are scared of refactoring because they are afraid of breaking things. So if we have a good test, we will, it will make our life easier. We can have an ease of mind to refactor the back code from the clean code if we have another test. So you will know you break something if your test is fake. So try to have some, uh, some uh, good um, practice of the, uh, having uh, some TDD or like test code and test method. And last but not least, leverage the latest tools and plugin. So most of the IDE, right, we have uh, those refactoring functionality. Instead of like manually deleting your code or like putting, extracting into the different uh, method or class, Try to use the existing ID functionality. There's a lot of function for refactoring. Most of the um, ID supported, so we can also leverage the using of like you know checking for some safety check, like if this code is used in uh, which places and uh, so far and so forth. And also some of those um, very good uh, well-known um, code analysis tool is a SonarQ. SonarQ is a static code analysis tool. It can give us like a, what is a uh, code quality of your code and also can uh, provide some of the recommendation also, okay, how to refactor and uh, uh, how to improve your code quality. So that's it. What's next? So if you want to practice more on those clean code and uh, to practice more on the refactoring and like understand about, learn more about the uh, code span and everything, we want to recommend first book from the clean code by the Robert C. Martin and Gabor. This should be one of the handbook from the other software developer. Then the next one is refactoring book. This is from the uh, Martin Fowler. So here it shows a lot of techniques and rules like how can we refactor. And the next one is, this is a Git repo. You can uh, download those, you can go to this Git repo and uh, practice to um, refactor the code also. The intention of this report, it is written in many languages, so you can pick out which programming language that you prefer. The intention of this Git report is they are intentionally write in the like bad code. So your main responsibility is to refer to. Okay?
yeah, this is some of the resources that we use it in our slide. And question and answer. Any question, any comment? Thank you. <laughs> any thoughts? Any sharing? Question and answer we can take for both. Like, don't hesitate to tell me any silly question as well. Yeah. Any code, Goldsmith, anything apart from this, just about team practice, just feel free to raise any yes. question. Yes. Quick comment. Sorry. Yes. Um, we will share the slide also, right? Yes. Yes, yes. Also, we can do a dev gym on Judith Rose. How about that? Yeah, so this Perfect. one is a very Perfect. popular kata to especially learn the refactoring part. I would highly recommend it. Go there. And one thing, if you really want to learn, don't look into the solutions. There are a lot of solutions available on internet. Don't directly go and watch the solution videos or the blogs. Try, try it out yourself. Try to understand. There is the business requirement explained. The code is intentionally kept bad. Try to refactor it. Like It's really good thing, good learning if you do a practice on this kata. Highly recommend it. Suggestion. Yeah, so um, this is like we are just giving us some surface of the idea only. So usually like most of the organization, I guess SonarQ is using for the code quality improvement. Um, it's also not very cheap, so far what I know. <laughs> uh, and uh, some of those like refactoring functionality, right? Regardless of which ID that you are using, there should be some basic function of the refactoring, like extra meta, extra class, or like, you know, create parameter or whatever. That should be keep um, using all those kind of things instead of like manually copying and paste on the different places. Because definitely, if you do manually, something might break also. Your code may not be like uh, a lie. And some, this is ES links is usually most of the front end developer use for the JavaScript uh, formatting and everything. It's also um, recommended. There are much more also. We just give some idea and an example here only. Yes, SonarCube support that. So if you run the, usually most of the enterprise project, like we have set up for the SonarCube repo, and then it, whenever people start checking the code, right? SonarQ will automatically run. There, I, I know that there's a, some plugin available for SonarQ also. You can uh, plug, use it in uh, your IDE level, within uh, your project level or whatever, because it will be quite huge to scan all those, like the whole code repo, right? But usually most of organization level we do for the SonarQ. When you check in at some code, SonarQ will automatically run. It will give you, if you have set up or some notification also, you can uh, get some kind of like how many, um, you know, issues or like based on the um, severity level, like what is a critical issue, what is a major issue, high issue, and they can also provide you some recommendation also. Those duplicated code, where is duplicated, which line is duplicated, so far and so forth. Thank you very much. Any others? If you're using an open source project, you can also use something like code refinement. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Or Of course, this is very common question, right? So like, yes, um, you can recommend. Of course, may not be get approved for sure also. Uh, another way also like, since you have know about how to write the clean code and uh, what is the code smell, right? You cannot keep on practicing also. Even those like you are just newly joined to the project, you are very junior also. You can suggest like maybe try to get practice, get, uh, keep on get uh, more practice and try to influence other people also. So maybe you start with your colleagues that who uh, you trust or you, you, you cannot you know, talk or share or whatever. At least like 
I feel like uh, most of the case, right, code review is a very good approach because nobody is perfect, even like, you know, people will be tend to forget all those principles and uh, good practices. So have a shared review within your peer or like your colleagues. And uh, like, you can also suggest to your senior, like, or maybe if you are not sure also, you can check with them. Why this code is too long? Why is written in this way? Is there any way that we can improve? You can suggest also. Just, uh, just to add on, so there is something called tech depth. So there is always a trade-off. And we understand that sometimes the business is hurry to deliver. So the internal quality of code sometimes can get ignored. But there's always a trade-off like uh, you want to pay less now or you want to pay more later. So the more you uh, ignore your tech tech debt. So as you mentioned, it's one year. So either you start working towards it and later, if you if you say you want to improve it after two years, it will be much more costly because the code has become much more messier. So the phrase that goes on pay less now or pay more later. So which one will you prefer? So you can always like encourage the team to get on the good practices and f like keep track of your tech debt. So even you, if we can highly understand that in a real business, it's not every time we don't have the super clean code. It's okay, we, but we don't ignore it. We keep a backlog of it and we will work on it later. So you can try to follow that thing like, yeah, pay less now or pay more later. Don't, don't forget to clear all those tech there also. Like, don't keep on adding and like forgetting to clean those tech deck. Yes. Any other thoughts, comments? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, programming patterns. Yes. So you think, uh, do you, which one I mean, do you recommend and you think it's e easier to test? I think it depends. Depends on the which line that you want to go for approach. So like even those React edit and uh, like functional also, right? There's a sum of the rules and principles can be appli uh, applicable even uh, for functional programming or OOP programming. And also you, of course, there might be some kind of like certain principles rule only can be applic applicable for the functional programming. So maybe if you want to go for that kind of journey, you can uh, uh, learn more and uh, get on practice. So sorry, like I, I don't have any clear answer for that kind of question. Uh, yeah, even I don't have much knowledge on that. But one thing I can explain you in a similar context. Let's say we have microservice architecture and because it's a fancy everyone running towards it. So like everything tends to solve a particular problem. So you need to decide what problem are you solving. So the object-oriented functional programming, there is a particular problem they both are trying to solve. What kind of problem you want to solve? So like I, I can explain more on microservice and monolithic, for example. Now the microservice is more fancier and everybody is doing it, so everybody kind of rushed towards it. But that's not a good thing to do. Try to focus what problem you're trying to solve. And there might be simpler solutions for that. So I I in this context as well, so object-oriented or functional or reactive, like the front-end React, you need to identify what type of problem and whether the solution you're choosing, it focuses on solving that kind of problem or not, rather than whether it's easy to test or not. That's not the criteria to choose the language. It depends on their, not on their programming language. I think it depends on their dev. <laughs> Whether you create a clean out code or you create a messy code is up to you only. The programming is just a, just a, just a tools to write the softer solution, uh, softer problem. Yeah. Yeah. So just to add some more context, now these programming languages are again created by some human who has some intention in his mind. Just for an example, uh, when I was going through how to write a clean code. I said, uh, do not expose like getter and setter, be mindful. But in Java Beans, by default, you will have a getter and setter for all the variables. So uh, each thing has a different intent. Like it's your responsibility to use it wisely, to have a cleaner code. So certain languages like the, the programmer who built it had certain things in his mind, certain focus in his mind, and that's why it's built in certain way. It's, it's not like this language is much cleaner, this language is, it's not like that. As a developer, it's your responsibility to choose the 
features and to use its characteristic in a well proper way so that you achieve a clean code Yes, true. Like yeah, so usually um, one thing that what I can say is like you show the business what is the value of the clean code. Like we have explained, right? Like down the road also, at the end of the day, your code will be very messy. Even those like they want to deliver, they want to push us to do the, some delivery also. They couldn't achieve because of the code are very messy. A lot of things to be referred to. A lot of things are broken when we integrate it together, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we actually had a diagram. We, we wanted to include that, but because of time constraint, we could not. So usually, to uh, explain this a bit, we we, hi we highly under yeah, this was the one. So there are two things: external quality and internal quality. So for the business, showing that external quality is good, meaning your user experience and the number of defects. This is your external quality, and business can understand. They will focus on improving the external quality. But your code quality is like something internal and as a developer you can understand it and it's not so visible to the business but it's more of a mindset and it's our responsibility to convince our business that this is equally important now this is from martin fowler's website so usually uh, let's say we are starting with a fresh idea we are create like a startup thing we try to deliver things very very faster so the yellow line you see is of low internal quality so initially the time to deliver is faster. However, if you try to maintain high internal quality, initially you might feel that you are slowed down, but after a certain point, and that is in weeks, not even months, you will be much, you will be able to f deliver and your productivity of the team will be much higher when you have a higher internal quality. So it's more of convincing the business. As a developer, it's our responsibility to convince them because the business people cannot see the internal quality. It's us who are able to visualize the internal quality. So if we want to keep delivering faster, we need to maintain high internal quality. That's, I hope that answers. Any any more questions? Yes, yeah. please. Uh, thanks for sharing with these companies. So I think I have a question on team practice. Uh, um, do you have any suggested practice to help the new program to grab the concept of like getting companies more into the design project so usually for those junior, like, I mean, one way that what we practice is like, we have some kind of pair programming. This is one way that we can uh, practice also. Either like you are less experienced programmer also, like, you know, you can pair with uh, those senior dev, then you can learn about more about the business and also like some of the good practices and some contests also. So this is what we are encouraging, but of course like, Maybe some organization also, the pair programming, not usually practice and very expensive to um, practice. Yeah, so any th thought on that? Uh, yeah, so I completely agree with Lynn. And just to add on top, pair programming is the solution for that. But if that's really not possible, given your current context, so maybe take small steps. When you have a very big, complex code, usually you will find that the 20% of it comes like uh, the 80% of the actual logic comes from 20% of it, like the Pareto principle. Try to focus on understanding the most, the most frequently used part of code. Once you're able to get hold of that, slowly you will be able to understand more. So I'm not sure if that's the correct name. I think it's the Pareto principle. So 80% of the value comes from the 20% of the code, something like that. So try to identify which is of the, like since it's very huge and very complex, take a small step and identify which one is mostly used and start learning small on it. Or let's say one thing you can do is if there are not tests, you can start writing the test. From my personal experience, uh, 
I was working on a code and it was really complex. I could not understand. There was no test also. Start writing tests for it. It will give you a lot of confidence in terms of understanding the code and also the change you are making. You are very confident that your tests are there to back up you. Like if it fails, you know what fails. How many of you have zero, zero test coverage? <laughs> okay. So you can start, like, take a first step towards it. Maybe in your team, encourage people to start something towards writing test. Yes, please. Uh, we can use a to do comment. So we have to. I just give some some you know example and like make a, some joke here only. So if we know that that to do to do comment is like you have to write a unit test right. Why you don't study in the first place? It is like you are violating one of those rules already, right? And another thing is like the comment is not bad. We can put the comment. Sometimes the comment can help for the some. Um, you know, developer uh, who are not familiar with the system or how the things are doing it. But usually, right, as a developer, most of the time, nobody read those comments. We j just deep dive into the code and then check what is doing and then what is this function is doing, what is this class is doing, right? So why we spend th so much of effort on writing those comments, which is, those are very obvious. Maybe it's very, very important information that you want to deliver. You can still write the comment, but I grandly like, 90% of the dev are like, just start looking for the code. <laughs> yeah, just to add, so to-do comments are not bad comments. They are considered as good comments. But what, what we want to avoid is don't get in a habit of writing to-do comments. One to-do, one or two here and there, it's fine, acceptable. But don't get in a habit of, I'll just ignore it, let someone do it, to-do. I'll add to-do everywhere. OK, write a test here, do this, do that. You are like, take step to refactor like you can spot something and if you want to refactor do it yourself if you don't have the capacity we understand we need to add the to do but don't get in a habit of adding it every time like too many of to do is wrong to do is a good comment in itself but too many of it is something messy yes any other thoughts sharing comments yes please do you mind to share more a bit like how to write tests uh, <laughs> I mean, because if, if let's say yeah, the code is very modular, I think it's easy to write tests. But if let's say like a like messy code, right? Then to start writing tests is like a Usu usually also right like um you can also think from the like like Rishita share also start from the small step. So even those like you know that they're very messy code. What you want to achieve, you will be adding for maybe one or two function or like doing something. Of course, the existing code with the very long method or long parameter list, it is very hard to start writing a test. And most of the time also, people tend to like forget about the test and then just add the code, right? So, but if you know that maybe there's a small function that you are adding, there's a small feature, you can start a test, why don't we start it? Uh, just to add on, so if you follow TDD, you write test before your production code, and that's much easier to do. But if you're writing test, for an existing code it's it's much much difficult to do so how to start like i'm not uh, so what i understand is usually you we write like characterization tests so for an existing code when you write you tend to just follow the code like the test will pass so that you understand what the code is doing from your test once you have the characterization test you start refactoring like you, let, let's say you have a big function. So just don't jump into refactoring. First write a test that's already passed on your existing code. Now there is a test to save your back. So if when you start refactoring now, you know that the test will tell you if you missed up something. So just write a test and maybe that test can be, uh, how do I say it? I'm not getting the correct word for at that. But maybe you get some kind of safety net like yeah, something broke. Your intention, the first step should be to get a safety net, then start refactoring and don't forget to refactor your test as well. The same principle, so if you remember the dependency inversion principle, single, res single responsibility, those are all applicable for your tests as well. So, yeah. yeah.
it should be okay. Yeah. Yeah. From from past experience writing like uh working on legacy code, right? I'm I'm sure you talk about legacy code there. So I guess the legacy code usually the first thing I'll do I put I would have done would have been to write unit test to cover that function. But usually with legacy code there's a lot of spaghetti code and there's a lot of tech entanglements and a lot of dependency already in that function which is which also lets you lets you understand a little bit better la, why the function is like so badly written, right? But if we can figure out the right the test coverage for that one function, right? Along with all the dependencies or all it needs, then you can uh, go proceed to refactor slowly. Uh, saying, oh, okay, now uh, th there's too many things being entangled into this function. Maybe I should break it up. And it helps you reorganize the code uh, better as well along the way. Yeah, so start with co uh, test coverage for at least the existing functions. There's no test. Uh, then you make uh, then you make uh, the, the update the test to introduce a new new feature or behavior, and then you uh, try to introduce the fix fix uh, introduce a new behavior. La. That's one of the ways you can try. Yeah. Oh, there was one more slide we added for that. I was looking for that, but we have skipped it. I'm not sure if that can come. You know, the approach we should take. There were like <laughs> list of approaches. Uh, I I I'll, I'll oh, try to get. Oh, okay. I think it's, it's really difficult to come up in one hour for <laughs> clean code and code smell. We wanted to cover a lot of things, but we decided to cut down, cut down. And yeah, this one is like, uh, ensure you have tests for your existing code. Start writing tests for your existing code so that it has it has a safety net then you should start writing tests for your new feature and pledge that whichever new code you're adding you will have a test for it before you start writing the code uh, yeah this is like the cycle that yes. will be followed yes any others yes please just a comment on that personal sharing your, your mileage may vary <laughs> <laughs> That's also a good you approach. That when you, you speak in a manner that's supposed to be not invalid, it's supposed to behave some way, write the test for that. That's, that's a, my favorite way to get started. And uh, yeah, so we will be taking on more questions. Meanwhile, we will be it will be very helpful for us if you can have submit the feedback for us. And meanwhile, meanwhile we can continue Q&A. Yes. So if you have any more questions, it's very interesting for us to hear. And I guess everyone is hungry now also. Yeah. <laughs> Let me chat with Kevin. Do we have more questions? Uh, the previous slide? Yes, get the slides and this one? No, the, the links, a few links. Ah, uh, okay. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, as mentioned, like a certain programming, like I, I may not be very uh, expert on answering that, but from my experience, what I can tell you is it's not that language gives you clean code. You need to identify which features, when to use, for what to use. As mentioned before, like we say that avoid adding, like exposing the private variable, avoid uh, adding getter and setter for your variables, but Java has it beans where it allows by default the getter and setters. So JS talk also has certain features for certain problems. Try to use it wisely and that will result in a clean code. It's not that JS doc promotes cleaner code. Every language has certain features. It's, it's your job to choose wisely which one is for what type of problem. Uh, in terms of energy efficiency, I 
am really not knowledgeable on that but uh anyone in else can answer that in terms of energy efficiency clean good thank you so much for the answer i i hope that really answered yeah so even yeah thanks a lot for sharing that i i got a very it could be a very silly question i'm not a developer mm -hmm. but i see the developer are moving forward i can show the whole world that's why i need to learn a little bit of the serious yeah so typically so for example if the foundry to Make other people look uh, see me as a developer. How long would it take? What do you think? <laughs> it depends on. I want to learn some language. Uh, what language you you are you know suggesting? Ah, uh, okay. It depends on your passion. Like, do you really want to do it? Like, oh, my passion is about the cloud, multi-cloud. Could mm -hmm. be for as a code, could be a Kubernetes, so much mm -hmm. service. I think it it really depends on you. If you have a passion, you can easily learn it. So nowadays, the coding like you might feel it. Oh my God, what is it? But with time, it has become easier and easier. The languages have become much easier. So they are here to help the developers. It's it's not like it's it it just depends on you how much you want to learn, how much you want to do. But there are a lot of languages and. to start with i would suggest you can start with javascript i mean that's very the common language how we speak the english language format the other languages are also not so uh, difficult but maybe for starting point i i i can suggest maybe start with javascript and then uh, you can move on to something else but trust me the languages have become easier more human friendly so it's not that big thing Anyone can learn to code now, and you just need to find the right forum and right resources that can help you. I hope that answers. Ah, uh, you have lot of Udemy courses. Like in in internally ThoughtWorks, we we follow the Udemy platform. You have Plural Site. You you can join conferences like this, and I would prefer like, I would suggest don't do it alone. find a buddy who is someone like you trying to learn and that is much more helpful uh join some like he mentioned developer gym or something 
those kind of events join them that will be helpful seems that all the bad good practices that we've gone through for example here come from like two main root sources which is like either a rational project and like no choice need to deliver and we're rushing and we leave stuff there or we're super passionate about it and we can't stop coding and it's super exciting and the code keeps good the project keeps uh, getting the result that we want and uh, we'll do that later and uh, just so excited about it. Um, I'm in the second category I'm super excited about that and I leave all those examples how do you, or rather, like, what would be your tips to uh, hold your horses and know where to get a stop and you get it? It's like, well, how do you hold yourself back from like, you know, going too far uh, and doing all that shit? Uh, my answer for that would be stay in that project for long because you are there when you are creating it. You are not there when it's failing. So if you really want to hold your horses, stay there for longer and see how it fails. As he mentioned, uh, developing is 10%, maintaining is 90%. Be for the maintaining phase. Then you will really understand the pain points and then you will never try to jump on the next feature without cleaning it up. So try to experience that pain. Stay there for longer maybe with that project which you created. So yeah, that would be like, because usually developers, like if you don't experience the pain, you will not clean it up. Maybe because you haven't experienced the pain yet or the people around you haven't like come and shouted at you. <laughs> <laughs> so be like, be like acting more professional. Let's say not for developer, let's say a plumber come to your house. He knows all the bitten tricks. You ask him to fix your tap or something. He knows that doing this will will do it for now, but maybe 10 days later, it might not. So if he fixes this just for 10 days and goes away, are you going to call him again? Like you realize every 10 days it's getting the same problem. Are you going to call that plumber again? No, right? You will start looking for another plumber. So it's the same kind of thing with the developer. We also need to be like, have some more professionalism. And once you experience that pain, definitely you will start working on the clean code. And apart from this, mostly how, uh, like I have experiences, there are code reviews. Because some like senior or someone is going to do that code review. In my team, if I write a code, it works beautifully, but it's not clean. It, it cannot get merged at all. I'll have to spend like 10 more days to clean it. Whatever it takes, it takes, but I need to make it clean. So that code review is like one, maybe you would in your team, it was not practiced well enough. So try to have good engineering practices. Some of the things they will take care. It's not just your responsibility. The, the setup nowadays with the latest tools and technologies, they enforce you to have a clean code. So the first barrier would be the code review. I would say, yeah, then a senior dev or an expert would never allow the messy code to get merged into the production. So that's what we follow in our team and that's the first line of blockage for messy code. Yeah, I hope that answers. Okay. Any any more questions? I don't know where Lynn went. <laughs> yeah. I am a front-end and back-end developer. I I usually, I, I have very minimal knowledge on that part. I will skip 
this question or maybe in the audience somebody have a better answer because i i i really don't have that expertise to answer like how do we like maintain cleanliness in the cloud architecture i i'm sorry i i really can't think of any answer for that any anyone cloud experience can share more on his uh, okay you you want to share I'm really sorry. I don't have expertise in that area. I haven't really touched that part in my career till now. I, okay, I think that's all. Since I was not able to answer, I'm not going to take any more questions. Let's <laughs> move to food.